as artificial intelligence becomes more advanced, businesses are finding new ways to use the technology with the end goal, improving productivity. Ross Greenwood recently sat down with Ahmed Mazari, who at the time of the interview was the president of Microsoft Asia. Now, on Thursday, he stepped down from the role after five years. So this could very well be his final interview in the job. AI has been one of the most pivotal technology shifts that we've seen probably over the last hundred years, and I might roll back into electricity all the way into uh, computing. Well, bigger than mobile phones, bigger Perhaps. than the internet. We think of this actually as a general purpose technology, pro probably like electricity. Uh, there's not uh, a, a technology that I could say in the last 50 years that has the parallels to be as pervasive as AI. But so, so AI and electricity, you're putting the two of those as breakthroughs for productivity, for the way in which we do things in the future. You're putting them in the same basket. I am because I'm energized by the possibilities. You could use AI in, uh, in a school. Uh, you could use AI in an operating theater for medical reasons. You could use AI to determine the risk of a financial portfolio. You could use AI to determine rock formation. Uh, you could de uh, determine new minerals. Uh, an example, uh, we actually worked with uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, Energy Board to create a new low lithium battery with 70% lower content. But the starting point was using AI, which found 32 million possibilities of a molecule. That can only happen with AI. Okay, so. Take me about the barriers to rolling out this AI. Is it people's imagination? Is it actually the physical constraints of trying to build the data centres that can hold all of that intelligence? Is it the fact that we don't have enough data to feed the AI machines? What is it? I think the answer could be all of the above, but let me probably step back and think about the role that us and governments would play in the evolution of this technology and making it more pervasive and, and adapt adaptable. Energy. We have to work with governments and ensure that we created new sources of green energy because we are committed to having a better planet. I mean, we have a commitment that by 2030 we will be carbon neutral and will be water neutral. Okay, but can I stop you there and say that to have AI, you've got to have massive data centres that are going to gobble up even more electricity, more energy into the future. So where does that energy come from? That energy will come from different sources. Um, Let's look at the work that we're doing with the government here in Australia. The, the Walla Walla thermal uh, ability to create sun power into energy is a big one. It's a 15-year commitment that will help us decarbonize our own data centers. We are seeing governments uh, across uh, at least the, the remit that I have, which is Asia Pacific, leaning on into new research. We therefore see a fundamental shift that needs to be made on how we think about moving away towards sources of energy that are not in your backyard. And therefore, how do we solve for battery? Battery will become critical to this because how do you store energy that is created in the middle of Australia and transport it to Sydney? And this research will have to be propelled by the government in conjunction with public-private partnership, and we have to make commitments for long-term uh, change in this space. So does that mean that there are still answers to be brought up in terms of, say, storing electricity? There needs to be technological breakthroughs that take place, but maybe that comes as a result of AI, the same as there'll be breakthroughs in health and health technology that will come as a result of AI, just being able to think faster and think differently. Perhaps you may have actually answered the question uh, in, in framing it. Uh, I, I pointed out to the work that we did in framing a new low lithium battery with 70% low lithium. Uh, there are more such examples that are in the works. Uh, we, as part of Microsoft research, are working on three broad areas of science. AI for AI in physics, AI in chemistry, and AI in biology. And in all three dimensions, we see that AI will play a role where our ability to create economic progress and productivity will get accelerated. Okay, in the past, the people who hold the technology, Microsoft being a classic, end up getting the riches as a result of that technology. One thing you've talked about is the democratization 
of artificial intelligence. And it is true to say that a person now living in the middle of Australia or the middle of Bangladesh, if they have mobile, if they have internet, if they have an ability to supply the world with information, they can create a business. Is this the way in which you see AI could also democratise even our economies across the world? I might answer that in two parts if that's okay. Uh, let me start with this point of how can somebody that's sitting in rural Australia, rural India, rural China, make a difference? I'll give you an example in India. Um, we may not be familiar, but even today, 88% of global languages are not served by AI. 88, that's 1.2 billion people. So with a startup in India, and the startup is called Karya, we're actually working to create tokens for a local language. Now the lady that, who I've actually met, who creates the, to, those tokens is making five times more than minimum wage. So there are two, two things there. One, you're creating economic enablement and bringing people into the workforce. Two, you're creating inclusive technology by bringing a language that is not traditionally served by AI today. And therefore, those two attributes give us the opportunity to create more democratization, as you pointed out at the start. So then take me to another aspect of this, because you, as a business, are trying to you know, distribute artificial intelligence in a responsible manner, but you're also trying to make money. You're a business. And so how do you balance those two issues, having on one side the public good, but having on the other side the fact that Microsoft clearly wants to be a leader in this area, not only from its standing, but also from the profits it makes? Ross, that's a terrific question. Um, our estimate is, and I think we have empirical data to confirm that what Microsoft makes on its platform, our ecosystem makes $3.5 on it. So for every dollar that Microsoft makes on the platform, we see a compounding effect on the ecosystem around us. So in other words, it's those who are using the platform who are actually generating more and making more. Another one for you, and that is, if all of a sudden all this technology improves productivity, or it should prove imp improving productivity. Why is it in major Western countries right now, including Australia, productivity is going nowhere? It seems that people are working harder and doing more, but they are achieving almost zero productivity despite all of this incredible technology. That, look, that, that's a question that goes at the heart of how technology gets implemented. Any technology gets implemented. Um, and we, if we look at uh, uh, mobile phones, you started with mobile phones. Mobile phones has been uh, with us for the last 20 years, but it's literally the last five where acceleration has happened in the use of mobile phones, where in apps that create the economic value that sit on the mobile phone. So similarly, if we think about AI, AI is a, is, is a general purpose technology, but it's the ability for a business like CFS, the colonial first business, and I met the CEO yesterday, right? 75% of their workers now use the Microsoft AI technology stack, and they are seeing productivity accelerate. Equally, uh, when I move away from Australia and give you an example of, of a doctor in Taiwan, this doctor where we've implemented AI is able to now prescribe to a patient within 15 minutes versus an hour they took for the whole experience. And pharmacists in the same medical center is able to serve 30 patients instead of 15. That's capacity, that's productivity, and that's the ability to either serve more patients or serve patients at a lower cost. Ahmed Mazari, great to chat to you today. Many thanks for your time. Thank you, Ross, for having me.